Games are a wonderful source of escapist entertainment. They not only distract us with pretty pictures and sounds, but they provide objectives and goals and systems that fill up parts of our mind that can't be touched by film or music alone. They're so good at this that it's been suggested they can even help alleviate physical pain. I bring this up not to harp on the oft-imagined miraculous nature of games, but because a lot of people struggling with emotional pain also end up escaping into games as a way of running away from suffering. And naturally, people who have coped with issues, like, say, depression, by playing games may be interested in eventually producing some games of their own. Such is the case with Depression Quest and Actual Sunlight. Though I'm hesitant to link these two games together just because they cover similar thematic goals, I feel it might diminish each by lumping them together as just those depression games rather than letting them stand on their own. But I think it's worthwhile to compare and contrast how they approach their topic. I mean, this isn't like comparing Goat Simulator and a scapegoat just because they have a superficial similarity in their protagonist species. Actual Sunlight and Depression Quest both deal directly with depression from experience, and how they complement and clash in equal parts sort of fascinates me. So, just so all the cards are on the table here, I've never actually been depressed. At least, not the sort of deep-rooted, chronic, and disabling depression explored in these games. I know very little of how deep that rabbit hole can go. I also think it's important to note that everyone experiences depression differently, and just because I, or either of these games, views what depression is differently from you, that doesn't invalidate your experiences. The goal here isn't to define depression for all people, but to talk about how each of these games dissects the idea in their own way. Depression Quest is decidedly the more mechanically focused of the two, which is a little ironic considering that Depression Quest was made in Twine and Actual Sunlight was made in RPG Maker. It systemizes depression by having your level of depression affect your freedom of choice. The more depressed you are, the fewer options you have available to you. It's subtle, but totally functional as a means of conveying the way depression saps one of energy and motivation. But more important than the raw mechanics of it removes choices is its selection of which choices to remove. Being depressed, the most outgoing, optimistic option is almost always disabled, unless you're doing exceptionally well, a near constant reminder that even when things are good, things aren't great. And as you lose ground to the illness, it reduces your options more and more. In time, depression becomes this self-perpetuating thing. Opening up and being honest and confronting it takes an emotional toll that you simply don't have the energy to expend. It can be hard to not give in to the temptation of picking the option that reads as the most healthy, but that playstyle largely misses the point of Depression Quest. It isn't about getting the happy ending or the sad ending by maxing out your score. This isn't infamous. It's about role-playing more than system mastery. It's about responding to these prompts as you feel you really would, to explore how depression impacts your character's abilities and feelings, and to see what options are removed from you by your condition. It conveys through systems how depression can limit your choices and make you behave in ways you wouldn't normally, but in order to do that, the game asks that you respond to the prompts earnestly. Actual Sunlight limits player choice too, but not as a means of showing degrees of depression. Instead, the game offers the illusion of choice and then explains the thought process of its protagonist, Evan Winters, as to why the choice isn't really a choice. For example, there's a scene where Evan decides to buy a video game. Not because he's excited about a new title or out of any real interest in playing it, but because buying and playing these games is a way of self-medication through retail therapy and escapism. If you decide not to buy the game, Evan goes through a long dialogue about how he might end up buying something even worse for himself, or how he'll go home, find himself with nothing to do through his sleepless nights, and be right back at the store in an hour. There's no changing your direction here. The game's awfully fatalistic. Not just about buying games, but about everything in Evan's arc. Before the end of the first act, there's a statement directly from the author, Will O'Neill, stating that it's, quote, pretty clear where all of this is headed. The game is about one man's inexorable downfall and presents false choice to reinforce the unavoidable nature of its conclusion. And that is perhaps the biggest difference between the two games, their tone and disposition. Depression Quest, as somber as it is, feels hopeful. Things can change. It's tough, it sucks, and if you don't get on it fast, you can find yourself spiraling out of control. But there's therapy. There are drugs. There are day-to-day -day decisions you can make to help lessen depression's impact. The deeper you get into depression, the harder it is to climb back out, but you can climb back out. And while it may take more emotional energy than you might think you could possibly muster, it also does a great job of showing why that struggle matters, as your relationships, job, and family fray apart if you don't fight for them. Even the simple fact that it doesn't treat depression as a binary disease reinforces the idea that things can get better. There's not just depressed and not depressed. There are many layers, and even within depression, you can fight your way back to more options, more sociability, more energy, and more happiness. 
actual sunlight takes a decidedly less optimistic tone. It doesn't offer alternatives or solutions. Evan doesn't go to therapy, he doesn't get on medication, he doesn't even attempt to work through his problems. His story is one of dissent, a warning to others about what depression does to an individual when left to fester untreated. The game starts with Evan suffering from moderate to severe depression and ends years later with his suicide. Consequently, it's easy to view the game as a bitter take on depression that ends without a glimmer of hope and sends the message that the natural conclusion of clinical depression is suicide, but actual sunlight isn't a distanced, nuanced take on its subject matter the way Depression Quest is. It's not suicide apologia, but a confessional pseudo-autobiography. It wonders how much further things could have gone for the author in the direction that they were once headed. Instead of a nameless character that is heavily influenced by your personal preferences, actual sunlight tells Evan's very specific story. The game openly confesses a desire to be a portrait of a person rather than a game. It wants to show the result of how untreated depression ruins lives, the way Requiem for a Dream showed how untreated drug addiction hurts its victims. This character study approach invites us to look at Evan the person rather than depression the disease. It grounds the game in a strong emotional core that Depression Quest lacks, but in doing so it becomes less about depression in the abstract and more about this one man's particular journey down a dark path. It doesn't say, this is what depression is and here's how to deal with it. It says, don't let depression turn you into this guy, because this guy's kind of an asshole and his story ends really tragically. Actual sunlight lacks optimism not because it believes there is no way out, but because it wants to show you how deep depression can drag you, how far down you can fall even if things start with just a little insomnia and self-loathing. With its more optimistic tone, Depression Quest makes a point of highlighting your support networks, even ones you might not realize you have. Siblings, parents, significant others, online friends, and even pets can all help you push through depression and come out the other side. Depression Quest's perspective is that people, by and large, want to help you, but two things get in the way. First, your feelings of insecurity and lethargy prevent you from reaching out and receiving that help. The embarrassment of dealing with depression can silence you from reaching out to your brother. Self-doubt about whether you're even meaningfully sick can cause you to skip out on going to therapy. Depression robs you of your ability to ask for help in Depression Quest. Second, a lack of understanding of depression in general causes people to act in ways that can hurt you without intent. A great example of this is telling your mom early in the game about these feelings you've been having. She shrugs you off with a cheer up buddy, being sad never helped anybody speech. The game makes a point of saying that there's no malice or anger in her voice. It's just genuine advice from someone who fundamentally doesn't understand what your character is going through. In Depression Quest, people want to help. It's communicating and understanding that you need help that's hard. Evan, on the other hand, sees his support networks as a burden. There's a scene where Evan takes a shower and a voice tells him to jump off the roof of his building. On the way out the door, however, his parents call and ask him to go to dinner with him that weekend. The same anonymous voice then whispers, don't go to the roof. But it's framed as sort of an obligation. Can't kill myself today if I have to meet the parents on Saturday. His parents aren't something he can lean on, but obligations to be penciled into a schedule. He has no friends and harbors mostly either contempt or envy for those he works with. While he pines for someone who doesn't have reciprocal feelings for him, he settles into a relationship with someone else. Both relationships leave him unsatisfied, and he never realizes that it's his creeper nature and self-loathing that ruin both of them. Evan falls not just because he has no one to reach out to, but because he pushes everyone who might care away. Again, where Depression Quest asks you to reach out no matter what, Actual Sunlight wants to bluntly show what happens when you don't even try. The two games are also heavily influenced by the age of their creators in ways that shape the experience of Depression Presented, but it sort of manifests in different ways. Depression Quest is about someone in their mid-ish 20s, unmarried, childless, and despite being employed, still uncertain about what their long-term goals in life are. The more autobiographical approach by the authors allows them to sculpt a wholly believable series of encounters and relationships. Alex's exasperated patience as she tries to stand by you, your mother's genuine concern that manifests as accidental judgment, the cat that gives you company on quiet nights when every other person you can reach out to is busy. They feel like characters and events designed to deliver lived experiences, reflections of moments that particularly hurt or helped given a clearness of form through writing. It's a game about people in their mid-twenties suffering from depression, because it's by people who are in their mid-twenties suffering from depression. In contrast, Actual Sunlight takes the same youngish, childless, and unmarried professional angle, but carries it with an almost weirdly ageist bent. 
Reading from Will O'Neill's statement from early in the game, the fact that you are young means in and of itself that you still have a lot of time to change things. It's when you get into your late 20s and early 30s, like the protagonist in this game and like me, that a lot of the choices you made earlier can start to come seriously into play. A lot of doors begin to close. A lot of things start to go on without you. This game is about a 30-something corporate dead-ender with no youthful energy, no people his own age who haven't moved on that he can turn to, and no time or money left to change or undo any of those things. If you aren't at at least 25, that ain't you. The intent is to tell young players that they still have time to get the help and make the changes Evan refuses to, that despite how they feel, hope isn't lost yet. But that yet is important. It implies that suicidal depression at 35 or 40 or older is justified because those people are out of time and options. Depression Quest may paint a picture of depression in only one phase of a person's life, but it never presupposes to say that other phases are any more or less bleak. Actual Sunlight is very explicit about what age it's okay and not okay to be suicidal, and that's kind of troubling. But while suggesting at what age it's appropriate to be fully depressed is sketchy, the broader concept of age contributing to depression does tie into actual Sunlight's greater themes. The game frames depression as a symptom of white-collar labor and desk jobs that value the young, dumb, and drunk more than it values the mature, settled, and more expensive older workers. You see this in Depression Quest 2, where a menial day job leaves you unfulfilled, but also financially trapped. There, though, your day job is just an obstacle. In actual sunlight, the argument that vapid middle-class careerism contributes to depression is front and center. It ties self-loathing to jobs that have no immediate service or benefit, and hopelessness to positions where short-term profits are valued over customers and the work being done. So what's to be done? Well, you can buy into the careerism like Russell does, but doing so means buying into its shallow values. Or you can try to ignore the bigger picture and make whatever progress you can until you hit a glass ceiling or you get kicked out, like Troy. Or you can, like Evan, see the flaws and hypocrisy in the environment you're trapped in and reject them. Give up trying. Give up caring. Wonder every day why you bother and what it's all for. Which, you know, is a great environment for someone with depressive tendencies. Middle class ennui is a concept explored by both games, but it's actual sunlight that points fingers at corporate dysfunction as a genuinely contributing factor to depression. All told, I think the two games complement each other nicely. Depression Quest's mechanical focus and dispassionate approach against actual sunlight's inescapable but intensely personal freefall. The hopeful game about the struggle of living with depression and the dour game that serves as a warning of its dangers if left untreated. At the same time, though, the strengths of each highlight the weaknesses of the other. Actual Sunlight has a gravitas, an emotional heft that Depression Quest seems to sorely miss in its quiet contemplation of everyday events. And Depression Quest manages to capture both the beauty and melancholy of day-to-day -day life, the small emotions, little fears, and passing thoughts that Actual Sunlight avoids for fear of detracting from the operatic power of its punches. I wouldn't say the two are stronger together, and I certainly still hesitate to lump them into one bin. They're both games that demand to be looked at on their own terms, but I will say that I think having played each gives me a stronger understanding of the other.